the future. This is how filmmakers imagined the future would look back in the 1920s. But in this documentary, we're going to be looking at how professional futurists emerged and how they describe likely future scenarios. Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation because the prophet invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that in 20 or at most 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. On the other hand, if by some miracle a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everybody would laugh him to scorn. This has proved to be true in the past, and it will undoubtedly be true, even more so, of the century to come. Surprisingly, a futurist does not attempt to predict the future. What futurists do is try to understand the big trends in the present and by studying them work out how they may develop, how they may play out, what the interplay between those trends may be and how that will shape society and business, in fact the world, in decades to come. The French writer Jules Verne was probably the first of the modern futurists. Verne didn't describe himself as a futurist because 19th century society didn't have a word for somebody who studies present trends in order to predict their possible future development. Of course, there were earlier celebrated visionaries who provided glimpses into the future. The Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci, a polymath and a true Renaissance man, is probably the best known. Leonardo painted masterpieces and imagined aeroplanes, helicopters, submarines and parachutes, but his inspired 16th century visions were flights of pure fancy. The technology that would, centuries later, make such things possible couldn't even be described during his lifetime. Even earlier there was the Oxford scholar and monk Roger Bacon, who in the 13th century seemed to imagine much of today's world. Without any knowledge of modern technology, Bacon described planes and cars, submarines, telescopes and robots. This far-sighted genius also described the principles of what would become modern scientific methodology. Of course, throughout human existence, there have always been people who claim to predict the future. There were witch doctors and shamans religious leaders, gurus, all trying to tell what the future held because they wanted to convince the public they had divine connections, connections to a higher entity. But the proper study of the future didn't begin until the 19th century, until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And the reason was because up until that point, most of human life had been very similar. The future was much the same as the past. If you were a farmer's son or daughter, then your life in the future would be very much like your mother or father's. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution started taking people from the land, sending them to the cities to find jobs in factories, that the future started to change dramatically. By the late 19th century, things were changing very rapidly. Based on the vibrant and rapidly growing trends in science and technology of the 1860s, Jules Verne was able to imagine giant earth-boring machines in his novel Journey to the Centre of the Earth. It's unthinkable, but it must be true. A man took some tools and went where no human being had ever set foot, alone. Went into the interior of the Earth. And in 1863, Verne wrote a more serious non-fiction work called Paris in the 20th century. In this book, he suggested that by the year 1960, society would have developed to the point that it valued only business and technology. Verne's publisher at the time rejected this manuscript because he found it too unbelievable. Whether Verne's forecast was right or not, you can judge for yourselves. Attempting to please his publisher, in 1870 Verne produced his most famous novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. 
Of course, Verne wasn't alone in spotting the huge changes that were occurring. Writers and thinkers in many parts of the industrialising world realised how rapidly things were changing. They saw that people were leaving the fields and heading to the cities. People were looking for jobs in the new factories and their lives were changing as a result. In Russia, the writer Konstantin Tsiolkovsky was deeply influenced by Verne's future visions. Born 30 years later than Verne, he wrote over 400 books and papers on the future possibilities of technology. In 19th century Germany, many writers were speculating about the future, most notably Kurd Lasbitz, and there was even a series of popular postcards produced for the German public which depicted such futuristic and fantastic inventions as personal flying machines, underwater railways, movable houses, police x-rays that could see through walls, and machines for altering the weather. But the really big star of Victorian futuristic literature was Britain's H.G. Wells. His books brought him world fame while he was still a young man. And later in life, he actually practiced as an overt futurist. He wanted to warn the world about the danger of wars, and he wanted to shape society for the better. He understood how profound the changes that technology were bringing would turn out to be. Wells' 1895 book, The Time Machine, was a tribute to Victorian technological development and a specific attempt to imagine where such progress might lead humanity. H.G. Wells' follow-up works were mostly futuristic, including The Invisible Man, the War of the Worlds and First Men in the Moon. As Wells grew into middle age, he started to write non-fiction of the type that modern futurists would recognise. In 1901, at the age of 35, he wrote Anticipations of the Reaction of Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Thought. It's not a catchy title, but it became a bestseller. Taking the developments in mechanised transport as his point of departure, Wells told his readers that they were living through a reorganisation of human society that would alter every dimension of life. Wells described the growth of cities, increasing social mobility, the disappearance of servants, the explosive growth of motorised vehicles, the building of dedicated highways for vehicles, the onset of mechanised world wars, the ascendancy of English as the world language, and the emergence of global geopolitical blocks. And he foresaw all of this in 1901. Towards the end of his life, Wells called for a global government to be set up. And in the 1940s, he even foresaw that a global network of sorts was developing. He imagined connecting all of the libraries in the world together in what he called a ganglia to create a world brain. And he was deeply worried about the effect that rapidly developing technology would have on future employment prospects. We, are, we have increased the productivity of our social, of our economic organization so greatly that a smaller and smaller proportion of people can produce everything that we need. The consequence is that a larger and larger number of people are being forced out of employment and are unable to consume. By the 1920s, the future as a topic was occupying the minds of writers in all the industrialised societies. In Russia, Yevgeny Zamyatin wrote a novel called We in 1929, and in We, Zamyatin imagined Big Brother. He imagined a surveillance society, and it was this book that influenced Orwell so much that he actually copied a lot of it in his later novel, 1984. In Czechoslovakia, the writer Karol Kapek became the first to describe androids in his 1922 play, Rossum's Universal Robots. In the play, he predicted that humanoid robots would destroy their human makers and take over the world. But it was the English writer, Aldous Huxley, 
who wrote one of the most memorable pre-war futuristic works. Huxley came from a distinguished scientific family and in 1931 he wrote Brave New World, a book that he set in the future, in the year 2540, or as his characters in the book call it, 630 AF, which stands for After Ford. Brave New World was written as a parody of H.G. Wells's more utopian novels. In the book, technological economic output has created a life of leisure and extreme social inequality. Naturally, none of what you have seen would be shown to betas or gammas, much less to deltas like these. But each of you is an alpha. You weren't mass-produced in computer-cloned Bakunovsky batches. And you are all supremely happy, supremely content. But then, that is truly the perfection of our civilization. Everyone is adjusted. Everyone has been conditioned to want to do the work he has to do. And thus, everyone is perfectly happy, perfectly content. Alphas like you, betas, gammas, deltas like these, or even epsilons. Interestingly, Aldous Huxley was the first mainstream writer to describe himself as a futurologist. The terms futurist and futurologist actually mean precisely the same thing. Futurist is used more in the United States, futurologist more in Europe. But although Brave New World was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, later in his life Huxley started studying the future properly and by the 1950s he was worrying about the major trends and their impact on the future. Uh, the first of them is not exceedingly important in the United States at the present time, though very important in other countries. Uh, this is the force which in general terms can be called overpopulation, the, the mounting pressure of population pressing upon existing resources. Uh, this, of course, is an extraordinary thing. Something is happening which has never happened in the world's history before. I mean, let's just take a, a simple fact that between the time of the birth of Christ and the landing of the Mayflower, the population of the Earth doubled. It rose from 250 million to probably 500 million. Today, the population of the Earth is rising at such a rate that it will double in half a century. And then, of course, there was George Orwell's famous book, 1984. It was the book that resonated throughout my generation, along with Brave New World. But although Orwell wrote 1984 as a futuristic book, in reality it was about his own times. Published in 1948, it was about the future of communism, about the future of a surveillance state, about Big Brother, and as I said earlier, it was heavily based on Zamyatin's novel, We. The global reordering that followed the end of the Second World War forced the American government in particular to try and start thinking constructively about the future. The government wanted to know how to keep its lead in weaponry. And of course it didn't just want to concern itself with the sort of world government the United Nations that H.G. Wells had been pushing for, it actually wanted to keep its technological advantage. And as a result it encouraged the setting up of think tanks specifically designed to advise the government about the future. On the East Coast, the RAND think tank was established to consider the future of arms development and warfare while on the West Coast, the Stanford Research Institute, better known as SRI, was tasked with studying social trends and with fostering economic development in the area that would later become Silicon Valley. By the 1950s, there were many academics, philosophers and writers who were studying the future systematically. And from this point on in our history, I'm going to focus on those who were primarily futurists or futurologists. Perhaps one of the most notable to emerge in the 1950s was the British writer and futurist Arthur C. Clarke. 
After serving as a radar technician during World War II, Arthur C. Clarke published a paper in 1946 that predicted the arrival and wide usage of telecommunication satellites. In the 1950s, Clarke began a series of magazine essays that eventually became Profiles of the Future, a work of pure futurology that was published in book form in 1962. But Clarke is probably best known as the co-writer of the Stanley Kubrick film 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was adapted from Clarke's own short story The Sentinel, which he wrote in 1948. See, Clark was a seminal figure in the 1960s, writing science fiction and futurology. He predicted that one day we would all have pocket transceivers, which would allow us to talk to other people anywhere in the world. Today, we call them mobile phones. He was knighted in 1998, and his long-term predictions have proved to be uncannily accurate. It will be possible in that age perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali just as well as he could from London. In fact, if it proves worthwhile, almost any executive skill, any administrative skill, even any physical skill, could be made independent of distance. I am perfectly serious when I suggest that one day we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. In the technology mad 1960s, there was a craze for future prediction, especially in North America. All sorts of academics, philosophers, psychologists, English professors, media gurus got in on the act. And although they weren't full-time futurists or futurologists, they started to paint pictures of what society would be like in the future. Media professor Marshall McLuhan told us that the medium is the message, by which he meant that the message itself is shaped by its delivery mechanism. Psychologist Timothy Leary told us to tune in, turn on and drop out, using mind-expanding drugs. And astrophysicist Carl Sagan described the future of space exploration. In the UK, British computer scientist Jack Good, a former cryptologist colleague of Alan Turing at Bletchley Park, warns humanity that artificial intelligence would one day rival human capabilities. The 1960s can be seen as a golden age of futurology. So many people were spending their time talking and writing about the future. But the person who emerged from this group was Alvin Toffler, a former journalist who in 1970 produced a seminal book called Future Shock. Future Shock was a worldwide bestseller and it inspired me to want to become a futurist. My name is Alvin Toffler, and I'm a futurist. All of us think about the future, but a futurist devotes more time to thinking about the long-term future, not just what's going to happen next. Having watched the arrival of new technologies and having lived through the 60s and seen a whole bunch of other social changes taking place, I concluded that change was, in fact, accelerating and that most people didn't have a kind of organized picture of what was going on. And so we began thinking about this and trying to organize our heads and, and create mental models for trying to understand this. It was the dawning recognition in, on our part that something humongous was happening and that it, that it was like secret knowledge because nobody else, nobody else got it. Toffler had been a very active socialist in his youth and he cared passionately about the workers that were being displaced by technology. He followed up Future Shock with other best-selling books, including Third Wave and Power Shift. Toffler's books sold all over the world and he influenced world leaders, including Mikhail Gorbachev, China's Jiang Ziyang, Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew and South Korea's Kim Jae-jung.
For 30 years after the publication of Future Shock, Alvin Toffler remained the preeminent global futurist. But in the 80s and 90s, other names began to emerge. The writer John Nesbitt, the astrophysicist Michio Kaku, and Ray Kurzweil, an ex-MIT computer scientist who actually has joined Google as head of engineering. Ray Kurzweil describes the technological singularity, the point at which computers become as capable of problem solving as human beings. Well, by 2020 we'll have computers that are powerful enough to simulate the human brain, but we won't be f finished yet with reverse engineering the human brain and understanding its methods. Uh, one of my main themes, uh, and I've developed this thesis over 30 years, is that Information technology grows exponentially. The power of computers, our understanding of the human brain, the spatial resolution of brain scanning, the number of bits we move around the internet. I mean, many different measures of information technology double every one year, every 11 months, 13 months, depending on what you're measuring. Uh, so these technologies will be a million times more powerful within 20, year, <coughs> 20 years. In fact, the speed of exponential growth is itself speeding up. So in 25 years, these, these technologies will be a billion times more powerful than they are today. Today, there are thousands of futurists in almost every developed nation in the world and in some developing nations. Some futurists specialize in certain sectors, such as travel or tourism, lifestyle, even beauty. But others like me remain resolutely generalist. It helps us to see the interplay between the trends. Despite there being major problems in the world, not least with democratic functioning, few governments pay attention to futurists. Few governments have taken Alvin Toffler's advice and begun to think about what he called anticipatory democracy, by which he meant a democracy that thinks about the long term. Our governments are still resolutely short-termist. They take no guidance from futurists of any flavour. And that seems to me a real loss, especially as we are living in this dichotomous, this difficult future where technology is progressing, almost it seems, at the speed of light, while humans themselves and society changes at a speed which seems closer to continental drift. What is clear is that although futurists are relatively new in our society, we now need them more than ever. <laughs>